Thank you for listening to the Salmon Trout Steel Editor Podcast. I am here with Keith and Zoe Johnson, right smack dab in the middle of winter steelhead season. Thanks uh, for being with me on the podcast today. How about you tell us a little bit, what have you guys been doing? Have you been fishing? What's been going on? We've been fishing every day. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a weird season. We can't fish out of our boats. Um, but all in all, I, I kind of like this rule change now. The, the pressure is greatly reduced. And it's forcing us to slow down and really pick apart water. And I think that's kind of like, you know, my favorite thing about this season so far. Well, that's a good kind of positive take away from it. Although at the same time, the uh, lack of opportunity due to it is is difficult. But yeah, you're certainly making the most of it. Um, now, with uh, this season in particular, it's 2021 February. And let's talk about that kind of uh, 2020 and 2021 season where you had winter steelhead fishing occurring and kind of, I would say, the worst early season showing of steelhead that I've seen um, in in the recent past. Um, and that kind of feels like it's saying something. But how did you, how was your experience with the early season of winter steelhead? I agree with you. It was a pretty tough season. Um, but also, on the other hand, I fish a lot of plugs. Um, the reason being in January, we get a lot of rain, so we're fishing high water. When you can't bobber dog, it becomes very difficult to target these fish, especially in moving water um, when they're not holding. So without being able to fish plugs, you know, it's kind of tough to say really, um, but being restricted to the bank, it's like, it's one of those things like, was it poor returns or was it like limited access? You know, I really don't know. Yeah, so many factors. It's subjective. You could have down uh, down numbers, but some, you know, maybe some good opportunity, or some, you know, good numbers or bad opportunity, bad access, and uh, ultimately it's just making the most of it. So what are you gonna do if you're in the case of you can't really you can't fish out of a boat, but you can float down out of a boat? What type of techniques are you normally doing, and how are you covering a river? I'm assuming kind of what you've done in the past is sometimes some longer floats and you're covering a lot of water fast. What are you doing doing now in terms of the length of the float and how are you covering water? For sure. Um, I've had to definitely rethink how long I can spend in some areas. Um, generally, if I was able to fish from my boat, I'd fish very fast you know, throw two, three casts in a spot and just keep on moving as quick as you can and cover water. Um, and the game plan for this season, with that not being an option, is we're kind of cherry picking the river system. We're, we're choosing the sections we decide might have the most fish. And we're really spending time there and picking it apart. We'll go through with small presentations, we'll step it up with something big, you know, like maybe a four, a four and a half inch worm or a, a 20 mil bead and some jigs. And if you can't, if you still can't get a bite and you know there's fish in there, it's, it's a spot you routine, routinely catch fish in during those conditions, we'll throw something on that's just out of this world, you know, like, a six inch worm or an eight inch bass worm, you know, something you can't even buy for steelhead in pink. And it doesn't matter if the river's high and dirty or low and clear. Sometimes that giant presentation will provoke a strike. Mm. And I'm not sure why, I don't know why they do it, but it, it happens often. Doesn't that kind of speak to um, the difference between what would be like a bead bite and something reacting to a plug backing down at its face kind of two different things a feeding response and then more of an aggressive response for sure um i feel like there's always fish you know that are fairly aggressive and that, that's probably the fish that's going to bite something the first cast through the run mm -hmm. and i think there's also very large steelhead 
that a little presentation might not catch his attention. Um, maybe he's not in a mood where he really wants to bite anything until something huge comes by his face and kind of invades his territory. And he might not be trying to eat it, but he might be just grabbing it and trying to push it away from him, you know. So what is it about these uh, these worms? And, you know, worms have become such a massive part, especially of targeting big fish. What have you found with colors, and what do you like to, to play around with with worm colors? You see patterns? Um, for me, I, I actually keep my chest pocket on my waders full of every color of worm I can get my hands on. And I'll go through a run with, you know, a tried and true color for the water color I'm fishing. Um, you know, if the water's got low visibility, I'm going to go with something bright and neon just to really be um, more visible to the fish. And when the conditions become low and clear, I'm going to go with darker colors. I might fish a totally natural um, brown nightcrawler worm, or I might go with... Um, a worm that, like the nightmare pattern, where it's red and black, um, or Captain America, where it's got, you know, a, a lighter pink color, it's not so bright. Mm -hmm. And if those don't work, I don't even care. I reach into my pocket and I put the next worm on, and I throw <laughs> that through there. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, I've gone through, you know, several colors, and then all of a sudden, I've gotten a bite. Really? And... Some I believe most times it doesn't matter with color. Mm -hmm. um, and I only do that in areas where I'm not leaving this spot till I get a fish because I know I'm going to get a fish there every day. Yeah, and, yeah. And so you're like, man, I can't leave here. I get fish here every single day I've ever fished it. Yeah. And so you just start going through those colors. And I don't know, maybe the fish got tired of seeing something go by him so many times. Maybe he's sitting behind a boulder and... Your presentation never reached him until that 15th or 20th cast mm -hmm. through there. Because um, yeah. oftentimes they push themselves up be behind obstructions so tight that you couldn't drop anything in their face. So maybe that fish decided to move away from there and then you were able to show them what you were using. It, it's tough to say. We've been talking a little bit here off the microphone just about hooks and jig hooks and everything and you're doing something interesting. Tell me about the size of jig hooks that, that you're using for these big trophy steelhead. Um, this wasn't my idea. It, it was something that I kind of progressed into over the years of guiding. Um, I routinely have clients, um, you know, that are very new to fishing or even some that have been fishing a long time and... Um, some people really prefer to fight a steelhead as hard as they can and try and land it as quick as they can, whether that's your style or maybe you're panicking because you haven't caught many of them. Um, whatever the case may be, uh, I've had a lot of people straighten hooks on these big steelhead, and I started off having people break leaders on fish like that, so I upped it to 15, and that wasn't enough. And now I'm at 20-pound fluoro, and I use nothing less no matter what and I have now found a hook that can withstand 20 pound leader and that's a 4 op mustad and that's what I run on all my jig hooks and no. I, like the reason for that is I'm not after a average steelhead I'm I'm trying to find a steelhead 30 plus pounds yeah and when you think about a four out hook in a 30 pound Chinook, it's nothing. That's, that's no big deal. So obviously a, a 30 pound plus steelhead, they have a big mouth. That's a strong fish and you it, need a big hook. It really seems like a different animal at that, at the certain point of year. And so Keith, Keith, now you guide, um, let's, let's talk about this four out jig hook. What, what time of year of is that first of all that you'd be doing something like that fishing those worms what what months out of the year i start typically mid-january as soon as i find um the big wild fish start entering the systems and that's not i'm not saying you're not going to find big hatchery steelhead but they're few and far between you might go an entire week and only hook one over 15 pounds 
But when you're targeting these big wild fish, they're coming in the rivers late December sometimes, and um, it really peaks in March. So usually I would say February, March, and April, I'm if I'm fishing worms, it's on a 4 out jig head and 20-pound fluoro. For these trophy steelhead. For these trophy yeah. steelhead. And I'm talking 20-plus pound steelhead. And for one, you know, it gives you the ability to land them and also you land them quicker so you're stressing them out less and you're releasing a greener fish um, and, and I feel like that is going to really help the mortality rate. For sure. Hey let's talk about that now that you mentioned this mortality rate. Now you're fishing on a part of the Pacific Coast in particular in Washington and there is Washington regulations in place on not being able to fish out of a moving boat or an anchored boat. Um, and it is based on some data or, or based on an assumption that 10% of fish caught when released die, these steelhead. What is your thought? Are you killing one out of every 10 wild steelhead that you catch? I'm definitely not. Um, for two reasons. I fish beads and jigs predominantly and uh, the jig head is almost always in the roof of the mouth and the bead hook is never down in their throat. Mm -hmm. You're rarely hooking these fish in a place that's going to cause them to bleed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I can't think of one single fish when I'm targeting these wild fish without bait, you know, like. February, March, April, we can't use bait. So we're out there targeting these big fish um, with artificial only. And in all the years I've guided, I cannot think of one fish that I felt like swam away and died. Mm -hmm. Well, how many, how many dead steelhead have you seen on the banks or in the river during, during wild steelhead time? It's kind of funny you ask that because you don't see them. That's what I'm saying. I, and I've asked a couple different people about this. And I know that I'm talking anecdotally, but when you do um, think about the sheer number of guides, you know that we talk to who fish day in and day out, they're not seeing that. Um, I I understand you want to err on the side of caution, but I think the 10% number is outrightly wrong. Yeah, I think that's very high. Um, I think for summer steelhead in hot water, you know, really warm water, it would probably be a different scenario yeah and also something else to think about um you know for people like us we handle these fish um, we don't drag them up on the shore and let them beat their heads against against the rocks and so you know maybe that's where they're getting their numbers who really knows it's tough to say but we should really see more of those if that's really happening but. yeah and i'll tell you why um that's true during the fall when you're targeting Chinook with bait, Chinook have a pretty delicate mouth. If you mm -hmm. hook them in the tongue, they bleed a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's very common to hook them in the tongue with a hook when you're fishing bait. And oftentimes you will see a dead Chinook laying in a tail out of a big deep hole. For sure, yep. Um, but you don't see that with steelhead. And Salmon are different, and you'll see that out in the ocean as well with like coho release. Mm -hmm. It can there can be a lot of mortality to it, but it does seem like steelhead are a lot more resilient, even up to the stage of spawning and after, and then kelting out and going back down the river and you know all these crazy things that they go through. C certainly, um, and steelhead are so tough. Like they have their sides ripped open from sea lions or or who knows what kind of predator, you know, completely ripped flesh off their side and they have a two inch long gash you know three quarters of the way down their side and you can see their muscle tissue and they're still surviving um you actually see that a lot unfortunately you really do um yeah and that brings me to my next point uh, the sea lions <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah do we get into that i'm not sure maybe tomorrow yeah <laughs> yeah i mean they're at there's no question they're a terror. And then the cormorants, at least in the Columbia River, there's, it's different rivers facing various things. But, yeah, sea lions are never a, 
nice thing to have, especially inland and tidewater. And when, you know, there isn't the salmon stocks that they wanted, the biggest wild steelhead are going to look the tastiest to them. Certainly. You know? And they're coming in for springers and stuff, and you've got those late wild steelhead coming in in April with the springers, you know? Mm -hmm. There's still fresh ones coming in in the Columbia, and there's just so much predation, and you see it Certainly. on the fish. And, and you still get these wild steelhead coming in through May even. Oh, totally. Yeah, so... They're a pretty amazing fish. So, big tackle, big fish, hopefully hook a big fish or two this season. Um, what have you uh, What have you seen as far as the caliber of fish so far in 2021? So far this season, um, the average size of fish, um, especially the hatchery fish, have been 15 to, you know, 16 pounds. I wow. mean, very big fish, and, wow. and surprisingly a lot of them. Um, I just recently switched over and I'm targeting wild fish and in the last three days we've landed a fish over 15 pounds every day. Wow. And um, as a matter of fact today we got one that was 20 and one yesterday that was 19. <laughs> it's wow. pretty dang lucky uh, and I'm seeing big numbers of fish too it, so I don't think we have a low return um, and I'm, I'm really not sure what's going on there with WDFW claiming we have such a low return. Then maybe we do have a low return and... You're just catching them all. Since the the gill nets aren't in, mm. maybe that's why we're seeing more fish in the upper river systems. Well, that's good. That is good. Makes a big difference. Even if the overall numbers are down, if you can have some good opportunity, less pressure and stuff. So... Now, with winter steelhead getting later and later, are you fishing worms all the way through the end of winter steelhead season? What other stuff are you playing with? Certainly. I fish worms um, almost always. I don't think there's a bad time to fish a worm. <laughs> uh, I do know as spring hits and water temperatures start to warm up, and this goes for summer steelhead as well, um, late summer when the water gets warmer, the steel had really liked to start biting jigs. And I find that late winter as well. Hmm. I don't know what causes that. It, it could be water temperature or, or maybe just kind of, you know, the life cycle. They're entering a later life cycle and they've seen a lot of bigger baits and a lot of beads and whatnot. And then they see this jig, you know, a custom tied jig that maybe nobody's ever thrown at them. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So I'll fish jigs kind of later in the season. What kind of, uh, if you're going to pick three different colors for steelhead, not not a jig, not a worm, not a bead, not a plug, not anything, just three colors. And just you can, colors. You um, can have it in everything. Yeah. Three of them. I would say pink and pink and pink. <laughs> for steelhead. Um, okay. For steelhead, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I, I'm kidding, like pink, yeah. pink's always a go-to, red's very good, and black is very good. Mm. Well, that is good stuff. Let's, uh, let's talk just a little bit more about steelhead tactics and covering water. What kind of, uh, what kind of water are you looking to find the biggest fish in? What's funny about that is... I don't really know where to look for big fish. Um, experience has kind of shown me um, where I'm gonna find these big fish routinely. And it's one of those things where the biggest fish is the most dominant in that hole. Uh, and so obviously they're going to pick the very best spot every single time. And what I find is most times if I find a big fish, it's in a spot I've already caught a big fish. And they're just the top dog out there and they want that spot. That's interesting and they, yeah, certainly they're a dominant creature and that's a common theme I've heard and in some sense recognized as well. So now with that, um, what do you think about line shyness of that wild steelhead? Is that a big factor for you? I think it can be on systems that are heavily pressured. 
but for the majority of these steelhead, they're coming out of the ocean and they may have sat out there for three years or four years or five years or who knows how many years and haven't seen a single thing until your presentation hit them in the face. And I don't think it matters if you're using five pound leader or 25 pound leader. Hmm. That fish is going to bite it. Um, and if you think about salmon, if you catch, you know, a 20 pound Chinook, that fish is often caught with 30 or 40 pound mono. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell me their eyes are going to see leaders differently. Well, they do, don't they? They do have different eyes and kind of capabilities, but I think it's a it's a absolutely a true point. Yeah, it's most not, of the time not going to be a factor with a giant fish that doesn't know to be line shy. Yeah, we're not talking about like a resident trout that has lived its entire life in one hole for six years. Totally, totally. we're talking about a fish that lived its entire life in an ocean. And just seeing your presentation yeah. for the first and time. Being aggressive essentially the entire yeah, time. Yeah, totally. Doesn't they don't have hands, nope. so oftentimes they're curious, and they're gonna grab something that this guy that's never fished in his life before just threw out something you know that his grandpa had in his tackle box that he may have just found you know. Yeah. And it's just the goofiest setup, and he catches a fish of a lifetime on it. And, mm. and it's probably his first sail he's ever caught. Yeah. So I, I don't think these fish are line shy, and I don't think they're picky. I think you just got to find a fish for you. Um, and oftentimes... It's very inspirational. Yeah. Often, <laughs> oftentimes, and what I mean by that is we all have our favorite presentation. Mm -hmm. And to us... It's going to catch every fish it's willing to bite out there, but that might might not be true. Your buddy might have something that looks absolutely ridiculous to you, and you'd never throw that on your line. But as soon as a fish sees that, he goes for it. That is part of the fun, and it is fun to play around with some different, different things and some different colors. I do find it interesting that um, I've noticed you and a couple other anglers that are catch a lot of steelhead, the switching of the colors is interesting because I would tend to kind of think, okay, I'm going to throw a jig, I'm going to throw a worm on a jig, and then I'm going to throw a spoon or something like that. Totally. Whereas actually switching out to a different color, okay, I'm going to throw a jig, and then I'm going to switch to a different jig. Okay, now I'm going to go a jig head with a worm, and now I'm going to do three different colors of worms. That's It's interesting. It is, and, and I'll tell you why... Um... Like, so, before I started guiding, I was just one guy throwing one thing through a hole. Mm -hmm. um, and now, oftentimes, I have three people in my boat, and they throw three different things. You know, one might have a jig, the other guy with a bead, the other guy with a worm, or maybe someone has a spoon. Mm -hmm. And the guys in front of you, you know, you, you or I guess in front of them, you know, the first guy through, oftentimes, he's going to get a bite right away usually these, these steelhead bite on the first cast mm -hmm. um, and you really if you're fishing more than 10 casts in a hole you're probably not fishing an aggressive fish and you're better off moving down river and spending time searching for an aggressive fish rather than you could waste your entire day you know on fish that won't bite totally and and sometimes those fish are shut down so much that they don't want to bite for days until rain hits and the water conditions improve. Yeah. Um, but back to my point of three guys. Since I've been guiding, I have two or three people in my boat every day. And I always make sure somebody's fishing something different. And you'll see a jig go through a hole first or a bead or a worm. And it doesn't get bit. Or even bait. And then you know, the guy next or the guy after that throws through and he gets a bite and he floated the same exact line, the same depth, the same everything, mm -hmm. but it was something different. So you get to really experiment between them all. And yeah, that that's a huge advantage to have. And one of the things about that, you're out there fishing a lot. Obviously you do take time off, but when it comes to like wild steelhead season, 
Um, hatchery steelhead season, fall chinook coho, summer steelhead, all the different things you do. Let's say winter steelhead, besides for blowouts and times when you just plain can't go fishing, you're on the river pretty much every day, is that correct? Yes. So how do you sustain that type of intensity to get into fish? Um, very little sleep and a <laughs> lot of caffeine. Yeah, because you're rowing a drift boat down a lot of, a lot of times more technical water. And uh, it's a very physical thing. Totally. So, like, I, I eat a lot and I drink, you know, energy drinks and whatnot. Um, but I think more than that, it's passion. Um, I'm hunting, you know, a personal best or maybe a first for people. And it's very exciting being able to be a part of that. Um, and you get to see their passion when they hook up and their their eyes light up and and they realize like my goodness I just did this on my own you know and so I think it's it's kind of like the com the camaraderie and the atmosphere of being out there and just accomplishing something like that whether whether or not it was their first fish or their big fish or whatever you know you're out there in the winter or in the fall and your enduring elements. So at the end of the day, you feel like you accomplished something. You survived the day, but you also got to hang out with some cool people who had a better time than you did. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy to see your customer base and all the incredible people that go fishing with you and catch uh, some gorgeous fish in this Washington coast part of the world. Yeah, I'm very um, lucky. Um, and it all happened by accident. Like, I didn't plan for this. Um, yeah, how, how did you come about guiding and... and so I never even thought I could be a guide. I thought they were magical people who knew more than most people. Um, but I came home one day and I decided that I was going to try and guide because my social media platforms had, had been blowing up and I had so many people asking if I'd take them fishing. So I decided I might try to guide, and somehow it worked out for me. I, I don't advertise. It's all been, um, you know, natural. It's, it's a natural progression, and it happened fairly quickly. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think it's been really cool to see the growth. Um, I just, uh, I would put in a plug for fishing with you, but... I don't want you to get even more busy. So, yeah. Um, so don't go fish with Keith, is my advice. Yeah, I would. Because I would prefer to go with him myself. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I will just say, and obviously, you know, it's, you know, different fishing trips, and it's always a change in landscape and such, but I've been able to go out with you on some times when there's been some excellent fishing, and it's been a lot of fun. And I'm going to actually fish with you tomorrow if all goes well and uh, it's an exciting time. It's February. What do you think February is like here on the Washington coast as far as opportunity? I think February is just as good as mid-March, if you know where to go. Really? And tomorrow we're going to be... That's right. a big claim. Wow. Yeah. Because mid-March is magical. For sure. Um, and tomorrow we're going to have about 10 chances. Really? And now, it's going to be cold weather tomorrow. The temperature is going to drop. Are you not worried about that? No, not at all. Okay. Um, what will happen with these fish is they're going to be sluggish in the morning, and it's probably going to be tough to get a bite until midday. It's going to be one of those days where it might happen at noon, or maybe it'll happen at 10 o'clock in the morning. You don't know. Mm -hmm. But you throw every cast out there like you believe that bobber is going down. Yeah. And you might even yell at that bobber and tell it to go down. That works, doesn't it? It does work sometimes, and it surprises the hell out of you. Yeah, yeah. I just find if you say it enough time, especially if you're bringing someone fishing, um, all right, your bobber's going to go down right there. And you really right look there. like you know what you're doing. Yep. And then uh, and then it doesn't happen, but you say it at the next hole, and then eventually, ten holes later, you're right. You yeah, know? exactly. So. I, I've played it off like, all right, guys, get ready. Three, two, one, and it somehow you know by a miracle it really does happen and then it, you look like you i know saw that i saw that happen actually when you 
you and I and Frank Amato went. I think he was 78 at the time. He's, oh, man, he was a hoot to fish with. Oh, that was great. And you said that. You are like, okay, that bobber, it should be going. I think we have it on camera. Yeah. And uh, Frank's sitting there fishing a bobber, and he's like, oh, okay, this is good. And then bobber goes down. Whoop, yep. Chrome coho. That was, it was beautiful. That was awesome. That was one of those spots where it just happens every day, and yeah, people think you're magical. And it's like, no, I'm not magical. It's just time on the water and for everybody out Play there. Play it off. Just tell them it's magic. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know what? It's magic. I sprinkle a little dust in there. Yep. And, but yep. really, um, time on the water is the best teacher. It and is. when you go through a spot and you catch a fish, remember that spot. Oftentimes, that spot will hold fish during those same conditions. It might not if the water was higher or lower. So you just take a note. And over the years, I, somehow I remember, I can't remember anything else, but when it comes to fishing, I, I don't forget a fish. Like, I remember the hundreds of fish my clients have caught, and when and where, and so I'll, I'll catch a fish in a spot, and I'll just kind of take a note and remember what the conditions were like for that spot, and, you know, a week later, when we get more rain and the water's high, I know fish are going to be there again. So, time on the water is key. Key, absolutely key. Now, what about switching rivers? Um, I noticed you're not afraid to drive, which is key for what you're doing for chasing trophy fish, which are very dependent on migration and certain timing. Um, what do you look for? How 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 close to a trip takeoff will you switch a trip? Um, sometimes I wake up in the morning and. You know, there's a couple of rivers in our area that fish very well when we get way too much rain to fish anywhere else. So if I wake up and I, I look at the graph and I'm like, oh, well, we're not fishing, you know, plan A today. So I'll pick up my clients and I'll just surprise them and be like, well, we're going here today because we got way too much rain. And oftentimes when you get too much rain, your first thought should be dam controlled rivers. Um, usually a dam controlled river, especially if you're fishing higher in the area near a dam, mm -hmm. um, as long as there's no more rain in the forecast, they might, they might not even open that dam and in that upper end of the river, you can't even tell it rained because mm -hmm. there's not enough rain draining through the valleys and getting into the river. So... Yeah, those are some interesting fisheries and one that I basically live on, uh, a similar type dam-controlled river. And, you know, one of the only bonuses <laughs> with dams when it comes to fishing um, is is there is that. So that yeah. could be helpful. So, yeah, like I wouldn't be afraid to switch rivers at any time, you know. Um, and just because you had a, a tough day, doesn't mean it's not going to be good tomorrow. I've had many great days and then a very tough day the next day and right after that a, another really good day. And nobody really knows what causes that. Maybe the fish weren't in the area you were in. You know, there's so many variables, mm -hmm. but don't let tough fishing scare you away. Um, I would say the most important thing is just look at the CFS and make sure you're not wasting your time in a river system where the water is just way too high to effectively fish. What if it's on a slower rise? Are you okay with that? Slower rises? Yeah, those are fine. Um, generally, I don't like to fish a rising river, but you can't control mother nature and oftentimes we're forced to fish rising rivers. I would say most of the time the bite's going to be considerably tougher but I have had some of the best days I've ever had on a rising river. Um, one of the first times I fished with my wife, um, we fished a, a pretty special little river on the Olympic Peninsula, one that's well known to fish, um, one of the first to be able to fish after a big rain. It just drops into shape right away. Uh, I had her on my boat the first day she fished with me, and. We had an average day, and we had an inch and a half of rain come in overnight. And another, I think it was like another half an inch through the day we fished. And the river was just constantly rising. And we hooked 
over 20 steelhead Ooh. on a rising river. By the time we were done fishing, it wasn't fishable. It was brown. Wow. Um, so you, you really just don't know. I've heard stories like that before, and that's there's these interesting little exceptions to all these stories. And it's just good to, good to share. For me, I know... I'd like to get out fishing more than I do. I do get out more than, you know, most, less than some. And I like sharing information with people like Keith because he's out on the water putting these things to the test, getting steelhead. It's it's a really interesting thing to see dedicated, you know, drift boat steelhead guides. Um, why do you do it, Keith? The hunt. Um, it's not even necessarily about catching fish for me. It's about being out there and fishing. Um, when I was younger, I had a bad day if I didn't catch a fish. Now it's just pursuing these fish is pretty special. You're out there and you're searching for maybe your personal best or somebody's very first. And it's really fun to be a part of that, like I said earlier. So I think why I do it is passion. You know, some people have it and some people don't. Thanks for being on the podcast today, Keith. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Keith Johnson. Check out Kfish Johnson. What is it on Instagram, Keith? Kfish Johnson. At Kfish Johnson on Instagram. You can take a look at some of his beautiful catches. Um, and uh, urge you to tell your friends about the podcast, comment, and let us know. If you enjoyed this, thanks for listening, and good luck steelhead fishing this year. Keith, what's the first thing you're going to be throwing tomorrow? Tomorrow, we're going to be throwing worms right out of the gate. I'm in. Let's do it. And as a little update and follow-up to this podcast, I want to tell you about our day of fishing. Keith Johnson and his wife, Zoe, fishing out of his drift boat. Had an incredible day. I started the day by breaking off, unfortunately, due to my lighter leader, um, a giant fish that Keith said would have went 20. Um, Keith wasn't joking when he said in the podcast that 20 pound is necessary. So we went up to 20 pound and uh, I ended up getting another one right around 16 pounds. Beautiful fish as well as another nice fresh buck in the lower part of the river, and Keith got a gorgeous hen. It was just a wonderful day of steelhead fishing, one of the best I've ever experienced. So thank you guys for listening. Check out the podcast, other episodes. Tell your friends, please. Would love to hear your comments and hear anything that you want to hear about on the podcast.